he believes that any kind of religious faith is a delusion based on the delusion because it's not based on evidence and um, he, he felt that faith and religion was dangerous um, but my reading and understanding of the book is Dawkins himself was a fundamentalist because the minute you start making dogmatic, dogmatic statements you become a fundamentalist yourself yeah and uh, I was just reminded by reading this author, John Lennox, he talks about how how biblical faith, it's not an absence of evidence, but it's actually a response to evidence. Mm. It's a response to historical evidence, objective evidence, which is experienced subjectively, personally, in a relationship with God. Mm. So biblical faith, it's not it's not blind faith it's actual actual opposite yeah and he was just pointing out john lennox how um, actually dogs does not provide any evidence himself to show that faith is is a delusion <laughs> yeah. and he's, he's pretty he's pretty ignorant of the uh, the, the yeah. historical roots of science and of christianity in general i mean the ignorance is absolutely it's almost it's almost comical jason <laughs> yeah you know and alistair mcgrath who, who wrote uh, a book called the dawkins delusion he claimed that dawkins had undermined his own position because he failed to engage with any serious christian thinkers whatsoever mm-hmm. you know so it, it, it's a really good book and um john lennox he goes he goes into the um he goes into the can I, the can question I? of uh, he's basically saying that these new atheists, new atheism, and mm. yes, uh, the skeptics that want nothing to do with faith whatsoever. Mm. Again, he points out that they don't really understand the roots in the history of science. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, if you want to go a bit deeper, the philosophy of science. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, the early, you talked about the early pioneers of science. Some of the main ones, I mean, Francis Bacon, mm. he, he, from 1561 to 1626, he's regarded as one of the fathers of modern science, mm. al- along with uh, Kepler. There's Pascal, there's Boyle, there's Mendel, mm. there's Newton, there's Kelvin, there's Clerk Maxwell. All these were these were Christian theists that believed in God. Mm. Mm. And he basically reminds us that this is, I mean, this is the key point. At the heart of all science lies the conviction that the universe is orderly. Yeah, yeah. I mean uh, the, the the atheists agree that there's order, I think. Mm. And the th- Christian theists believe that there's order. But the, the, the distinction is Christian theists believe that the order is due to the fact of God's design as being a designer. Mm. And Melvin Calvin, he was a Nobel Prize winner in, in biochemistry. And, and he basically says the monotheistic belief in God is the historical foundations for modern science. Yeah. Wow. Because uh, it's all, it all modern science, you know, is based in the rationality of God. Yeah. God being a designer. Yeah. Um, he mentioned that how many of these Christian scientists they became scientific because of this um, belief that God was rational and God had designed the universe. And Francis Bacon talked about how God has given us two revelations. He he talked about the law of nature. Mm. And um, the Bible... And what he talked about, he, talk, he says, if you study nature, it's evidence that 
there's rationality in nature, there's been, there's been a design. And um, they became scientific basically because uh, they expected law in nature mm. because they, they believed in a lawgiver, mm. which was God. Mm. Uh, so there was the book of nature and the Bible in, in, where rationality is to be found. Mm. And so um, modern science is based on rationality. It's what drove these scientists forward. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to study it more. Have you got any thoughts, Joe? Yeah, you, you said some really uh, interesting things. I thought it was good what you said about Dawkins talk, accusing uh, Christians of having faith and then uh, noticing that Lennox says that Dawkins has faith. And I think. I think uh, it's really disingenuous and for Dawkins and people, atheists like him, who would have that kind of dogmatic attitude and say that Christians who, who have faith, well, it's dangerous. And people like Dawkins and an atheist who, who espouse this, such as people like Aaron Ra and the Magic Sandwich Show, it shows their lack of scholarship, the lack of real intellectual depth because uh, only a cursory glance at the philosophy of science, for example, will show you that even a scientist who uses the, the uh, scientific method has to have faith. There are certain things that a scientist has to have faith. They have to have faith that the sensory perception uh, is reliable. They have to have faith um, that reality is real. So this idea to say that, um, you know, <coughs> faith is a dangerous idea just shows a lack of philosophical sophistication and a lack of depth really uh, and that's why most academics who are real academics um, they they respect Dawkins uh, for his work on genetics but they they regard him as a bit of a fundamentalist uh, yeah. with his atheism and they don't take him seriously uh, because of that uh, so that's the first point. Um, the second point about the history of science, I mean, we mentioned this late earlier today. Um, you, you can even go back for, I mean, you, you said to me, and uh, it's true that the Greeks had an influence on the scientific method, uh, and that is true. But also, um, you know, even in the Middle Ages, I've done videos on this if people want to go and find out where even. There were bishops in the Middle Ages who were advocating that we had to go and do uh, investigate nature, and it, and it all stems from the fact that you write about order and rationality, but also about that nature is good, and we should also uh, that it's that it's worth studying, uh, whereas other pagan religions and and um, other viewpoints don't put that emphasis on nature that it is good, which was part of the in encouraging people to do uh, science. So right through the Middle Ages, uh, there were bishops calling for uh, doing the scientific method. And we, we can get into later on uh, these myths that atheists and others have created, um, historiography where they try to say that the church has impeded uh, scientific method and science. And we're going to explore some of those myths and show that it wasn't actually the church, that it was actually Aristotelian philosophy, which we'll get yeah. into. So, yeah, yeah, you've made some great points there. That was another thing as well about um, what these um, atheistic fundamentalists do and others that aren't informed about the real roots of science is they want to set up a conflict to wipe out faith altogether from society, from schools, from the government, from anything. And so there's a misunderstanding in, in, the, in lay people's minds, Jason, mm. about the myths of conflict. And there's two in particular. One was Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. And the other was Huxley and Wilberforce. Mm. 
And I just want to read um, what John Lennox says here. Well, there's, a, there's a few um, long words in there that I can't pronounce, so but I'll get the main gist of it, I think. But he says this... What page is it, Mark? This is page 23. Yeah. I just think it's good to read through, Jason. Yeah, yeah. It says, one of the main reasons for distinguishing clearly between the influence of the doctrine of creation and the influence of other aspects of religious life and be it said religious politics on the rise of science is so that we can better understand two of the paradigmatic accounts from history that are often used to maintain the widespread public impression that science has been con constantly at war with religion. So they use this debate between Galilee and the Roman Catholic Church to put up a false yeah. um, idea that there's a conflict between um, religion and science. It says, these accounts consume the most famous confrontations in history. The first just mentioned above between Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church. Upon closer, closer inspection, however, both these stories uh, about Galileo and uh, Charles Darwin's Huxley, uh, both these stories fail to support the conflict theses. A conclusion that comes as a surprise to many, but a conclusion nonetheless that has history on its side. Hear me up, Jim. Yeah, yeah. It says, first of all, we note the obvious. Galileo appears in our list of scientists who believed in God. He was no agnostic at loggerheads with the theism of his day. Dava Sobel, in her brilliant biography, Galileo's Daughter, effectively debunks this mythical impression of Galileo as a renegade who scoffed at the Bible. It turns out, in fact, that Galileo was a firmer believer in God and the Bible and remained so all of his life. He held that the laws of nature were written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics and that the human mind is a work of God and one of the most excellent. Furthermore, Galileo enjoyed a great deal of support from the religious intellectuals, at least at the start. The astronomers of the powerful Jesuit educational institution initially endorsed his astronomical work and endorsed him uh, and uh, fetched him for it. Fetched him for it. However, he was vigorously opposed by secular philosophers who were enraged at his criticism of Aristotle. Mm. This was bound to cause trouble, but big emphasised not at first with the church, at least in the way that Galileo perceived it. For in his famous letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, he claims that it was the academic professors who were so opposed to him that they were trying to influence the church and authorities to speak out against him. The issue at stake for the professors was clear. Galileo's scientific arguments were threatening the all-pervading Aristotelism of the academy. In the spirit of developing modern science, Galileo wanted to decide theories of the universe on the basis of evidence and not of argument based on appeal to the general authority of Aristotle. Um, Aristotelism was the reigning worldview, not simply the paradigm in which shine, but it was a worldview in which cracks were already beginning to appear. Furthermore, the Protestant Reformation was challenging the authority of Rome. From Rome's perspective, religious security was under increasing threat. threat. Um, oh. Then he goes on here, in this bit here. He says, um, it says, Galileo was never tortured. Oh, sorry, it should be noted, however, that again, contrary to popular belief, Galileo was never tortured and his subsequent house arrest 
was spent for the most part in luxurious private residences belonging to friends. Um, there are important lessons to be gleaned from the Galileo story. Mm. First, a lesson for those who are disposed to take the biblical account seriously. It is hard to imagine that they are any today who believe that the earth <laughs> is the centre of the universe, with the planets and the sun revolving around it. Uh, that is the accepted Copernican view from which Galileo fought, for which Galileo fought, and they do not think that it conflicts with the Bible, although almost everyone at and before the time of Copernicus thought with Aristotle that the earth was at the physical centre of the universe. Um, That's Copernicus, I think, Rob. That's right, Jim. So, Basically, what he's saying, what he's saying is, um, when um, when Galileo threw his telescope, yeah, he claimed that um, he he claimed that the um, the Roman Catholic Church was um, <clears throat> in the academy it was dominated by um, Aristotle yeah yeah so the, the Roman Catholic Church the way they interpreted the Bible was um, through Aristotle's system yeah so they they actually believed because they were they weren't reading it in its literary context. They thought it was talking about the um they thought the earth moved around the sun oh. due to some text they'd not understood in the historical context. And all he was doing, Galileo, he was saying, You're not interpreting the Bible properly because you're looking at it through the lens of Ar Aristotle interpretation. Yeah. So it wasn't about the Bible, but they, the new atheists basically, they use the argument to say the Bible is ridiculous. Look what happened with Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. But yeah. what that was about, it was a de debate about interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So it's about correct interpretation. And as Christian theologians, that's what we, that's what we pursue to do. And um, so everything was dominated by Aristotle. So it was really Galileo. Was he wasn't attacking the Bible? Uh, he was attacking Aristotle. And and and, and also um, the Pope set, allowed him to um, print print uh, his book under so long as he wouldn't say anything about the Pope. But when he wrote his book, he put some characters in one of the characters was a caricature of the pope and it, it there was some insulting things about the pope within the book and he got passed by the the um the inquisition uh passed the book thinking because it had permission from the port but it was okay so it, it wasn't uh read properly and when it got published the port re read it and immediately recognized there were some insults to him and there mm. were personal insults insulting his intelligence and you know so it was it was about it was about these aristotelian this aristotelian philosophy uh that the catholic church had imbibed and also a personal conflict between galileo and the pope where galileo was really um was unwise in some of the comments that he made concerning the pope derogatory comments but it was nothing to do like you said with the bible and mm. um and yet this myth uh, as you rightly said has been used to create a, um uh, in people's minds that there is a conflict between science and religion because hey look look at the look at how the catholic church treated galileo and mm. it was nothing to do with science and the bible it was to do with Aristotelian philosophy, and it was to yes. do with personal conflict between the Pope and Galileo. 
Yeah, that's great. I, I couldn't have put it. That's why I need you, Jason, to put that clear like that. I would say this as well, Jason. What's amazing as well, right, is people can check these primary sources out themselves. Mm. And that's what we, you know, it's always secondary sources. Uh, you know, I remember Dr. McGonigal saying to us, he used to say to me all the time, always go back to primary sources. Mm. So you can you can find this out looking at the primary sources, the primary sources, the letters, the personal letters of Galileo. It's just a bit of research. And um, obviously he's got some secondary sources, and he, John Lennox, but those secondary sources he used will have the primary sources in. Mm. So can I just read the second bit as well? The, sec the second bit is the Huxley Wilberforce debate about Darwin. And I'll just read this, Jason. Yeah, go on, mate. It says... Um, is it page 27? It's page 26, yeah, 27, sorry, 26, yeah. yeah. It says... Um, just, just for folk who, who don't know, we're looking at J.C. Lennox, God's Undertaker, Science Buried God, published by Lions. We're looking at the book and discussing some of its contents. Go on, yeah. So this is the Huxley Wilberforce debate. This this is used again, Jason, mm. as a false um, a false assumption that there's this conflict between faith and science. This is what's used as well. Nor in fact does that other frequently cited incident, the debate on the thirtieth of june eighteen sixty at the British Association for the Advancements of Science, held in Oxford's Natural History Museum, which took place between T.H. Huxley, Darwin's Bulldog, and Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, Soapy Sam. The debate was occasioned by a lecture developed by John Draper on Darwin's theory of evolution, the origin of species having been published several months earlier. This encounter is often portrayed as a simple clash between science and religion, where the competent scientist convincingly triumphed over the ignorant churchman. Yet historians of science have shown that this account is also very far from the truth. In the first place, Wilberforce was no ignorant, ignorant. A month after the historic meeting in question, he published a 50-page review of Darwin's work in the Quarterly Review, which Darwin regarded as uncommonly clever. It picks out with skill all the most conjectural parts and brings forward well all the difficulties. It quizzes me most splendidly. Secondly, Wilberforce was no obscurantist. He was determined that the debate should not be between science and religion, but a scientific debate, scientist versus scientist on scientific grounds, an intention which figures significantly in his summary of the review. We have objected to the views with which we are dealing solely on scientific grounds. We have done so from the fixed conviction that it is thus that the truth or falsehood of such arguments should be tried. We have no sympathy with those who object to any facts or alleged facts in nature or to any inference logically deduced from them because they believe them to contradict what it appears to them is taught by revelation. Um, so they have a debate. It's getting a bit uh, dry. They have a debate, this Huxley and Wilberforce. So, uh, as to the contemporary accounts of the debate, right, so basically I had put forward that this this Bishop Wilberforce was a laughing stock, Jason. Yeah, yeah. That he didn't understand Darwin and he was a bit, a bit ignorant. In fact, he was a bit scientist himself and, and he was an academic. Uh, to, as to the, so these are historical primary accounts to, to the real debate. As to contemporary accounts of the debate, John Brooke points out that initially the event seemed to cause little or no stir. It is a significant fact that the famous clash between Huxley and the bishop 
was not reported by a single London newspaper at the time. So it's not as big as these atheists make out. Yeah. Uh, can can you know? I just can I just come in there just just yeah. just to help? Like, just for those who are who are listening in, basically what Mark's saying is this debate between Bishop Wilberforce and Huxley uh, in 1860 it was a it was a landmark debate that that secularist and evolutionist and atheist used, uh, especially in the modern period of especially in the 19 uh, from the the end of the Victorian period right up into the modern 20th century and use this as an argument saying the church um, is is just anti-intellectual behind the times and can't deal with science and and manufactured that that Huxley had won this debate when in reality it wasn't the case and, and that Mark's explaining the details of this yeah so Indeed, there are no official records of the meeting, and most of the reports come from Huxley's friends. Huxley himself wrote that there was a, was a inextinguishable laughter among the people at his wit, and I believe that I was the most popular man in Oxford for full for a full four and twenty hours afterwards. However, the evidence is that the debate was far from one-sided. One newspaper later recorded that one previous convert to Darwin's theory was deconverted as he witnessed the debate. Uh, the botanist Joseph Hooker grumbled that Huxley didn't put the matter in a form or way that carried the audience, so he had to do it himself. Wilberforce wrote three days later to the archaeologist Charles Taylor, I think I thoroughly beat him. Um, Another report gives the impression that the honours were about even, seeing that Huxley and Wilberforce have each found four men worthy of their steel. Frank James, a historian at the Royal Institute in London, makes the suggestion that the widespread impression that Huxley was victorious may well have arisen because Wilberforce was not well liked, a fact that is missing from most of the accounts. Mm. Had Wilberforce not been so unpopular in Oxford, he would have carried the day and not Huxley. Shades of Galileo. <laughs> On careful analysis, then, two of the main props commonly used to support the conflict thesis crumble. Indeed, research has undermined that thesis to such an extent that historian of science Colin Russell can come to the following general conclusion. The common belief that the actual relation between religion and science over the last few centuries have been marked by deep and enduring hostility is not only historically inaccurate, but actually a caricature to so grotesque that what, what that that what needs to be explained is how it could possibly have achieved any degree of respectability. It is clear, therefore, that powerful forces must have been at play. In order to account for the depth to which the conflict myth has become embedded in the popular mind, and indeed there were. As in the case of Galileo, the real issue at stake was not simply a question of the intellectual merits of a scientific theory. Once more, institutional power played a key role. Huxley was on the crusade to ensure the supremacy of the emerging new class of professional scientists against the privileged position of the clerics, however intellectually gifted. He wanted to make sure that it was the scientists who really the levers of power. The legend of a conquered bishop slain by a professional scientist suited that crusade and it was exploited to the full. However, it is apparent that even more was involved. A central element in Huxley's crusade is highlighted by Michael Poole. He writes, in this struggle, the concept of nature was spelt with a capital N. Huxley vested Dame Nature, as he called her, with attributes ascribed to God. Uh, I don't know what that's talking about there. Um, conclusion is, thus a mythical conflict was, and still often is, hyped up and shamelessly used as a weapon in another battle. The real one this time, that is, um, that between naturalism and theism. It's a ledger. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what we've looked at is 
the two con the two false conflicts put forward historically used is that there's a conflict between science and faith and those are uh, the Galileo episode and the, and the Huxley episode but you just have to go back to primary sources is that right Jason yeah yeah and check it yourself it's all there to check but, and get a proper a balanced view of um, what really happened but he goes on the real debate is this Jason is the real debate is between two worldviews isn't it Mm. When you talk about atheism, atheist, atheism, sorry, and theism or Christianity or what other faith, and it's simply this: um, the worldview of atheism is uh, naturalism. That's a worldview, and and naturalism basically is um, all we have is matter. Matter exists. So there's no supernatural at all. Mm. It's just um, matter. Um, and obviously the, Christ, the Christian worldview is there's, there's the supernatural. Mm. You know, matter is not all there is. You know, God created matter. So it's about two worldviews. One where... Um, Everything is explained by naturalism, and the other by um, um, the other by a belief in a supernatural, you know, supreme being. Do you, do you know anything else about naturalism, Jay? Uh, page twenty-nine. For the sake of clarity, we note that naturalism is related to, but not identical with materialism although they are sometimes very hard to tell apart the oxford companion to philosophy says that the complexity of the concept of matter has meant that the various materials philosophies have tended to substitute for matter some notion like whatever it is that can be studied by the methods of natural science thus turning materialism into naturalism but it would be an exaggeration to say the two outlooks have simply coincided materialists are naturalists but they are naturalists who hold that mind and consciousness are to be distinguished from matter. They regard the former as emergent phenomena that is dependent on matter, but occurring on a higher level, which is not re reducible to the lower level properties of matter. There are also other naturalists who hold that the universe consists purely of mind stuff. Naturalism, however, in common with materialism, stands opposed to supernaturalism insisting that the world of nature should form a single sphere without intrusion from outside by souls or spirits divine or human whatever their differences materialism and naturalism are therefore intrinsically atheistic so that's page 29 so i thought that that was helpful um yeah i think i think that naturalism um is falling on hard times at the moment philosophically um there are philosophers uh and academics out there who are beginning to get tired of this um this kind of closed system where they believe nothing can break into this closed system and the reason why academics and philosophers are getting tired is because studies in neuroscience on the brain uh, and looking at consciousness um, it's beginning it's become clear and becomes clear every day that science can't get to the bottom of what consciousness is and and it's because of things like that that people like Thomas Nagel uh, an American philosopher and other academic philosophers are, are moving away from naturalism and trying to think of other other ways of looking at things and, and basically, is the old adage, I think, is nature cannot carry the weight of explaining itself. It can't, it, 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 rationality is too big an, a topic for nature to explain. Uh, the beginning of the universe is too big a thing to explain for nature to explain. And it, it can, the, nature can't carry that weight. And, um, 
once you start to use nature to try to understand the origins of nature and some of the more profounder questions nature fails and you have to posit something bigger than nature so for example we see uh, within nature rationality and um, we, we can see that so you know we can investigate the universe and find knowledge within the universe that implies rationality within the universe and nature can't explain why there is rationality the another example is order there is order within the universe um, and if you believe that that there was a big bang a singularity which came by pure chance why would they why is the order how can there be order when you're operating on chance uh, nature can't explain these things and you have to you have to begin to posit something outside outside nature um, and yeah. that's why naturalism fails yeah he, um, he concludes with this Jason he says um, he says the key issue we repeat sorry thus the key issue is sorry the key issue is um, not so much the relationship of the discipline of science to that of theology, but the relationship of science to the ver various worldviews held by scientists, in particular to naturalism and theism. When we ask if science has buried God, we are talking at the level of the interpretation of science. Mm. What we are really asking is, which worldview does science support naturalism or theism mm. and that's a good that's an important question that yeah yeah because we've been saying that the christian vision we talk of worldviews is you know a world a worldview is something that shapes your outlook yeah you could call it vision the christian vision or the atheistic vision right which vision of life which vision of humanity um, makes sense? Which 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 vision of life makes sense of, of reality the best? Yeah. Makes makes sense of the world, and um, that's what you've got to ask. Yeah. He says this. He he says this quote. This is by Sir Peter. Medawar, mm -hmm. and he said, The existence of a limit to science is, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions mm -hmm. having to do with first and last things. Mm -hmm. Questions such as, How did everything begin? What are we all here for? and what is the point of living? And um, the science, the science can give the how, but it can't give the why, can it? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, um, I, yeah, I think I think it, you've hit the nail on the head about it. It, it is this conflict between um, theism and naturalism. It's an interpretation. Um, you know they they that you know people will go on like these evolutionist and atheist and whatever i just want to say quickly that uh there are some atheists that are not materialist they're not pure naturalist they they can have like some kind of mystical understanding of the universe kind of like buddhist but they're very few and far between but most atheists would come under the banner of materialist and naturalist naturalism um but it is a conflict of interpretation i mean the atheist and evolutionist will say you know we have the facts about uh evolution or whatever but i think it i think it is it goes bef before we even get there it, the, you know it, it's a philosophical interpretation of how we see reality 
and mm. um, what the naturalist is doing is, is making a philosophical assumption it's saying it's philosophically assuming that all there is is nature and that that is an assumption you can never you can never say if you if you're being intellectually honest that you that all there is is nature you would have to be open to the possibility that there would be more than nature so naturalism if, if you're a naturalist you're making a you're making a philosophical assumption and then basing everything from that um with theism we're not we're not just making an assumption we're making we're we're saying that looking at reality looking at nature uh looking at for example dna where there is information within dna complex information when we're looking at logic and reason when we're looking at morals that a naturalistic explanation of these things just doesn't wash it breaks down and that's why uh, what what explains these things is theism so theism fits reality better than mm. the assumption of naturalism that that can't stand up to any scrutiny okay, it has got no explanatory power because it's not explaining the big things within nature um that's what i think i don't know what yeah I think. yeah i was reminded of um when uh, i think it was john mccarthy he mentioned that about that scientist called herbert spencer mm. and he, he talked about he, he says everything that exists in the universe can be explained in five categories yeah. and he said it was time um, force yeah. action uh, space and matter yeah. so he says all, all he says all reality consists in those in those uh, five categories yeah. and then he talked about how in the first verse of the bible those categories are there mm. so for example you've got in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth mm. that's the first verse of, of genesis mm. so in the beginning that's time god that's force created that's action the heavens that's space and the earth that's matter <laughs> and you I, I mean how amazing is that I yeah. think he was around in the 1800s, wasn't he? I don't know. That sounds good to me, bro. Herbert Spencer, yeah. It's amazing. But, um, you know, all the scientists were getting excited about it. You know, thinking they'd found something new, but he was there in Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I don't think I've got anything else to say. Just... Um, I would recommend anyone to read this book, mate. John C. Lennox, God's Undertaker, as science buried God. And um, to check it out um, and get a get a proper uh, get a sorry get a, a get a, a correct historical overview between these debates between Galileo, because it, it all comes down to interpretation, doesn't it? Uh. No, it was about it was about interpretation between Galileo and um, the Roman Catholic Church and the secular academics. Mm. It's about interpretation between Huxley and Wilberforce. It's about an interpretation of worldviews, naturalism, mm. or theism. It comes every everything comes down to that mm. interpretation. Um, well, yeah, I'll just end it there, I think, Jason. All right, I've got a few quotes here that I could read and tell me what you think. Yeah. Uh, uh, t -t -t -t. Yeah, I find I found this really helpful. Uh, page fifty nine. 
Oh yeah. Just a, just a couple of more quotes, if that's all right. Uh, that's fine, Jim. Uh, page 59. How we can keep talking about it if you want. What, bro? <laughs> what did you say, bro? You can keep talking about it if you want, Jay. It's fine with me. However much, page 59, right at the bottom. However much we may debate the essence of the scientific method, there is no question as to the foundation on which that method rests. The rational intelligibility of the universe. It was Albert Einstein's astonishment at this that prompted him to make the famous comment, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. End of quote. Mm. The very concept of the intelligibility of the universe presupposes the existen existence of a rationality capable of recognizing that intelligibility. Indeed, confidence in human mental process processes possess some degree of reliability and are capable of giving us some information about the world is fundamental to any kind of study not only the study of science this conviction is so central to all thinking that we cannot even question its validity without assuming it in the first place since we have to rely on our minds in order to do the questioning it is the bedrock belief upon which all intellectual inquiry is built I shall argue that theism gives it a consistent and reasonable justification, whereas naturalism seems powerless to do so. He goes on, rational intelligibility is one of the main considerations that have led thinkers of all generations to conclude that the universe must itself be a product of intelligence. Philosopher Keith Ward sums up, to the majority of those who have reflected deeply and written about the origin and nature of the universe, it has seemed that it points beyond itself to a source which is non-physical and of great intelligence and power. Almost all the great classical philosophers, certainly Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant, Hegel, Locke and Berkeley saw the origin of the universe as lying in a transcendent reality. They had different specific ideas of this reality and different ways of approaching it approaching it but that the universe is not self-explanatory and that it requires some explanation beyond itself was something they accepted as fairly obvious thus the inference to the best explanation from the origin and nature of the universe to an underlying non-physical intelligence as a long has a long and impressive pedigree and i was just thinking of the atheist anthony flu uh, who became a he didn't become a theist but uh, as a, the leading atheist in the 20th century, he began at the end of his life to look at when he was about 80 to look at nature and he, he began to realize with all the uh, learning about DNA and the complexity of DNA that he began to see there was an in, there must be an intelligence behind that. And mm. that, that led him to move to deism, that there was a God who, who created things and set it in motion and sat back. And he didn't move to theism, but he was moving in that direction because he saw that the universe showed uh, rationality. So I, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. Well, I'll just have this bit on that, Jay, what you've just said. He goes on after that to talk about the nature and role of faith in science. Mm. And he says this here. He says, Professor of Mathematics, Sir Roger Penrose, whose understanding of that relationship was unquestioned, has this to say about it. It is hard for me to believe that such superb theories could have arisen merely by some random natural selection of ideas leaving only the good one by this. The good ones are simply much too good to be the survivors of ideas that have arisen in a random way. There must be instead some deep underlying reason for for the accord between mathematic, mathematics and physics. Certainly science itself cannot account for this phenomenon. Why? Because in the words of John Porcushorn, science does not explain the mathematical intelligibility of the physical world. Oh. For it is part of science's founding faith that this is so. We cannot fail to note that here we have two leading scientists 
explicitly drawing our attention to the foundational role that faith plays in science. Yes, faith. This may come as a surprise. Even Hello? Hello, Mark, your connection has gone down, mate. Hello? I'll just phone. I'll just phone Mark back in a sec. Hope everybody's okay. Hi, bro. Hey, yeah. yeah. You know. Just missed you about that mathematical science bit. Oh, yeah. Um, this may come as a shock to many, especially if you have been exposed to the very common fallacy mentioned at the beginning of this book and spread with speed by Richard Dawkins and others that faith means blind faith and belongs exclusively to the, the domain of religion, whereas science does not involve faith at all. Dawkins is simply wrong. Faith is inseparable from the scientific endeavour. Gordel's second theorem gives further evidence for this. You cannot even do mathematics without faith in its consistency. So go back to that, you know, it's about faith in worldviews, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Some have faith that um, naturalism explains reality and gives meaning to life and some believe that theism does mm. I, I i i think what what it is is um that there are foundations within your worldview within your position that you can't prove um evidentially so for example um you know, you. Uh, what can I? How can I put it? You, you've got to start somewhere in your system. There's got to be somewhere where you you begin. We begin with God. Uh, the naturalist begins with nature, mm. and that's the starting point. Uh, cutting back all the evidence, that's where we start. But we can test that starting point we can see which makes sense of reality and what we're saying is that if you start with nature and we ask questions about nature like uh, the rush why is the universe show rationality how, how does nature explain that and it breaks down it can't answer that question if we ask well if there's rationality in nature how does theism answer that how does God a God answer that well the answer is that god is rational and it talks about he made the world and made the universe so it's made in reflecting his glory and that's why there is rationality within the universe so you, you what i'm saying is you take the starting point of naturalism and the starting point of the, theism and then do an internal critique and see which which ones match up to reality which ones explain reality and now uh, Christianity, the theism, explains these big questions like rationality. For example, uh, the fact that there's fine tuning in the universe. Well, if you take naturalism, does it? How does that explain why there's fine tuning? Well, it it implodes on itself because it, naturalism begin began by chance. So how do you get order from chance? It it's not consistent. Whereas our, our position is that theism, God is a God. You break it to me, Jason. Sorry, mate. Our position is that God is a God. Can you hear me now? Now I can, yeah. But our, I missed the, missed the last couple of minutes. Our, our position is that God is a God of order. And so therefore he created the universe. And that's why there are these con the constants within the universe where we can have life here on Earth. So... So I'm, I was just saying that, that you just do an internal critique of theism and naturalism, and naturalism breaks down. Uh, basically, that's what I was saying, Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. It keeps going off a bit, Jay. All right. Can you, 
Can you just summarise again what, what you were just saying there? I was I was just saying that every system has some, yeah. every every belief system, whatever it is, atheism or Christianity, there's always a starting point. And that starting point can't be proved evidentially. You, you presupposition. Like if 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 the atheist uh, if the naturalist says all there is is nature right well that's just an assumption you can't prove it by like, evidentially you assume that yeah and our starting point is the trinitarian god that god is a trying god and uh it, it's our starting point we, we we could provide evidences but ultimately it, it's just our starting point and so what you can do then is you can do an internal critique of whose starting point makes sense so you take the uh, nature and you test the starting points with with reality so the naturalist will say uh, that all nature that all there is well, that's again, James. all right uh can you hear me can you hear me i've just heard you there yeah so i'm just saying that we're doing in terms can you, know? you can't hear me <laughs> Can you hear me? I can now. All right. I'll just, I'll just, if you can't hear me, I'll just keep going and explain it again. And all right. all right. Um. So basically, what I'm saying is, you take naturalism and you take theism and you look at reality and you see which one explains reality. And just take rationality. There is a rationality within the universe. There is order in the universe, and naturalism cannot explain that rationality. And it cannot explain that, it cannot explain that order um yet theism makes sense with rationality in the universe because it talks about god made the universe and god's rational and that's why we can see rationality within the universe and uh, god's a god of order and that's why we see order in the universe and the constants and so we just do an internal critique and naturalism implodes on itself did you get that hello sorry yeah Jay. yeah did you get that bro no i'm not forget. <laughs> all right all right well should we anyhow is it do you want to say anything else i didn't get that Jay. Do, you, do you want to say anything else it don't matter if you didn't get that if you want to say if you want to say anything else that comes to your mind and what was that, Jay? I was just saying, is there anything else you want to say about whatever, anything? I'll ring you back. You there, Jay? I'll ring you back. I'll ring you back. So, um, if anybody's got any questions uh, you want to ask, um, I'll put the uh... so if you want to ask questions. Uh, I'll just phone Mark back, see if I can get him. See if he phones me back. I'll just wait for him to phone me back. So, yeah, so I'm going over to... Uh, the video. So, if you want to ask questions... uh fire away ask us questions and uh see if i can get mark to answer so see if there's any hmm. 
Oops. Just trying to form my bike. Uh, that was a good conversation with Mark. Um, I enjoyed that. So let's see if anybody's asked any questions. <laughs> Is anybody asking any questions? Hi, Jay. Hi, Mark. You okay, bro? Yeah. Um, have you got any last thoughts, mate? Um, I just think um, for me, this book should be on everyone's shelf. <laughs> it's dynamite, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's all I've got to say. It, and uh, it is dynamite. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how anybody can not read this book and you know, and not be challenged. You know, it's just I mean, everyone should read it. What would you say, read What would you say though? What would you say to those who? who would um, say that hello hi Jay how are you what, what would you say what would you say to those who would say well you're getting all excited about John Lennox and this book uh, but he was a theistic evil he's a theistic evolutionist what would you say about to that um, I don't know, Jason, to be honest. I think if he loves Jesus, if he, lo if he loves Jesus and wants to follow Jesus, I, th I think that's, that's good enough for me. Like, no. What would you say? Um, I, w I would say personally, he... he um that he's provided in the book so far what i've read ammunition break up again Jay. can't you hear me no it's gone off can, can you hear me hello just keep talking Jay. you're all right all right i would i would say that basically uh his book provides powerful ammunition against uh, evolution and i think that secretly he doesn't really believe in evolution that he has to believe in evolution theistic theistic evolution to keep his academic career but he's provided within the book solid ammunition against evolution mm. that's what i would say mark did you hear that yeah i got that yeah yeah and uh that's well, it's, de it's definitely between it's definitely against evolution from an atheistic point of view where there's no god at all yeah yeah so uh i, I think it's an awesome book and uh i think it's absolutely devastating but i think it's yeah i, I do think it's also i know what you're saying but i think it's also devastating to evolution because you can take the things that he's saying and you can apply it against evolution as in evolution the evolutionary process i think well that's just me anyway i'll shut up now can you hear me bro Just phoning Mark back. Okay, folks, I'm gonna end the show 
now and i want to thank everybody for coming to listen i've really enjoyed it tonight um so watch out for a few more google hangouts every now and again and um yeah and uh, watch out for sermons and lectures and google hangouts from time to time and uh, god bless you thanks for listening please leave your questions underneath the video we'll try and get back to you at some later stage and love to everybody out there and stay firm in the faith don't forget to get hold of the book god's undertaker has science buried god by john c lennox published by a lion um me and mark have read many many books and uh we think this is an awesome book and everybody should read it okay thank you for listening and god bless you and see you soon thank you for listening god bless